Can I just say something first uh, about today? Because it's, it's uh, likely to be very warm, uh, we're told. If anyone feels at all uncomfortable uh, and is currently wearing a jacket, please feel free to do without. Uh, if, if you want to do so, nobody will treat it as any form of disrespect uh, to me. I shall probably do the same myself, um, nor, to any, uh, nor to the witness, nor to the inquiry. Um, now, today we have Dr. Walford. Um, Dr. Walford, would you please take the oath? Please state your full name. Diana Marion Walford. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Uh, before we start, I should say, with Dr. Wolford's permission, um, uh, that Dr. Wolford has a health condition relating to her voice, which might mean that we need to take more regular breaks um, than would otherwise be the case. We'll just see how it goes. Well, we, we critically depend upon your voice, so you, you'll let us know, I think, at any moment that you want a break, uh, and please do so sufficiently in advance. Uh, I, don't, I would hate to think that you're soldiering on despite. Thank you, sir. So there's a lot of ground to cover um, in the course of Dr. Wolford's evidence and a lot of documents to look at. And so that both Dr. Wolford and those listening know, broadly speaking, the order in which issues are going to be covered, um, let me indicate what the plan is for today. I'm going to start by asking Dr. Wolford a number of general questions about her employment history and also about the structure and organisation and systems for information sharing within the Department of Health and relationships between the Department of Health and organisations such as UKHCDO. Um, I'm then going to look at the question of knowledge of risk of hepatitis and the role of some of the committees or advisory groups on hepatitis. Um, and then turn to look at what will be a big topic in terms of documents, which is questions of the redevelopment of BPL and issues relating to self-sufficiency. I don't anticipate getting beyond that today, um, and then uh, once that issue has been fully uh, uh, canvassed, uh, I'll then turn, and this will be sometime in the course of tomorrow, to issues relating to the emerging AIDS crisis, the department's response, and, and Dr. Wolford's role in, in that respect. And then there'll be various other matters to pick up. But I hope that's helpful so that those listening, as well as Dr. Wolford, understand the broad course of, 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 um, of the evidence over the next um, two to three days. Um, Dr. Wolford, I want to start by just, um, as I say, going through your background, qualifications, early employment history. Um, you told us you qualified as a doctor, medical doctor, um, and in your witness statement you've said that you spent some 10 or 11 months as a senior house officer in St Mary's Hospital. Yes. Um, and you rotated through four departments, one of which was haematology. Yes. There was a haemophilia centre at St Mary's Hospital, and you've described a memory of preparing cryoprecipitate. Yes, yes. Now, what you've um, um, described in your statement is a number of um, difficulties, disadvantages in relation to patients having to wait, patients coming to the hospital in the night in pain and so on. Um, and you've said in your statement that you carried those memories with you in, when some years later you found yourself having responsibility for blood and blood products at the department. Can I ask you to explain what you mean when you say you carried those memories with you? Yes, it was really quite graphic. Essentially, the, um, the process, getting up for myself in the middle of the night on call as an on-call uh, doctor, it usually was the middle of the night, actually. I, my recollection was patients coming in, usually often young, young boys, young children even, uh, you knew that they'd been at home in pain, that they were coming in by ambulance. How long had the ambulance taken? Then they were waiting. I think that the pa I seem to recall that the patients at St Mary's who had haemophilia waited in a, a separate area from casualty, but they first came through casualty. And then I would be called, uh, hopefully in good time, get up, go 
across the road to the laboratory make up the cryoprecipitate. And that involved actually thawing at a 37 degree water bath. Um, some blocks, if you think about thawing a block of frozen soup, you know at 37 degrees it takes some time and basically you're watching it and it's not thawing as fast as you would like. And you know that the patient is out there waiting and in pain almost certainly, but waiting to have the um, cryoprecipitate. So you thawed it, you made it up into bags for infusion, brought it up to the doctors who were treating the patient at the time, and often you saw the patient in great distress. So that's my memory. And you can't forget that sort of thing once you've seen it. We'll obviously come back at later stages of your evidence to questions of cryoprecipitate in more detail, but did, did that memory mean you came to your role at the Department of Health with a view that cryoprecipitate was something that should be avoided, that it was a a rudimentary treatment and, and somehow old hat by, by the time you were at the department? By the time I was at the department, I would say it was considered to be old hat, if you like. I mean, I saw the downsides of cryoprecipitate. Uh, there were obviously some advantages. Uh, for example, you really needed to use it in von Willebrand's disease or for small children. But the advantages of, of uh, factor rate concentrate were by then very evident. I won't go into the disadvantages. You're going to take me through the disadvantages very soon, I'm sure, in relation to hepatitis and subsequently AIDS. But the advantages for, for patients with, um, with hemophilia, severe hemophilia, of factor VIII concentrate was so manifold that it was hard to think that you would want them to have the less effective more difficult treatment, which they couldn't use to improve their lives by having it at home. Now, just continuing with your um, your employment history, um, from the beginning of 1972, you were part of the North West Thames Haematology Rotational Training Program. That involved a rotation through various placements, including, I think, um, the, the North London Blood Transfusion Centre. Yeah. So you were six months at the North London Blood Transfusion Centre. We'll, we'll come on to issues about risks of viral transmission hepatitis in the course of the morning, but c can you recall whether that was something that was part of your training or, or, or part of uh, the discussions that took place at the transfusion centre? Well, certainly at the transfusion centre, for example, I watched how cryoprecipitate was was made. I mean, that was just part of my of the training. You, you watched, actually, didn't actually do it, but you watched the the technologist making the cryoprecipitate, which was made in, in, in regional transfusion centres at the time. So uh, that is, I certainly remember that. But do you remember anything specifically as part of um, um, your work at the blood transfusion centre? And I, I know it was only six months and hmm. a very long time ago. But can you recall whether, the, whether part of the, um, either the work you did there or the training you did there involved any discussion of the risks of, of hepatitis? I don't remember that, no. Now then, from November 1975 to October 1976, you spent a year as a Medical Research Council Research Training Fellow, mm -hmm. undertaking research at the Clinical Research Centre in Harrow. Mm -hmm. um, without going into very much detail, can you just tell us briefly what that research was about? Mm -hmm. Well, that was... Um, I had found that patients with Guj of Gujarati origin that we were looking at at Northwick Park Hospital um, tended to have very small red blood cells. And the main reason why you would have very small red blood cells is because of a lack of iron, so iron deficiency anemia. But these patients were not iron deficient. And we decided that it should be explored, and I got the training fellowship in order to look into the cause of these very small um, cells. To do that, I needed to employ the technique of globe and chain biosynthesis biosynthesis analysis, which was in effect a form of chromatography, a form of um, putting blood through, through a, a column and taking off samples at, at different intervals. And what uh, I was able to find, together with my colleague um, Rosemary Deacon, uh, was that actually there was a defect in the synthesis of the alpha globin chain of hemoglobin. Uh, so these patients had a form of alpha thalassemia, 
Nothing like as severe, of course, as the beta thalassemia that we all know about, but it had never been actually described before. So naturally, I was very pleased to have uh, actually been able to uh, discover what the problem was. It really wasn't much of a clinical problem because but the problem was that people kept giving them iron. These women were getting far too much iron, for example, weren't all women. Uh, so essentially, it was just good to have been able to describe a new entity, hadn't been described before, and it was written up, I wrote it up in the British Journal of Haematology. Now, you joined the Department of Health and Social Security, as it was then known, in November 1976, and we'll come on to that shortly. But as I understand it from your statement, Part of the uh, arrangement for working for the Department of Health as a, as a doctor at that point in time was that you spent one day a week undertaking clinical work. So yes. you were able to, as it were, keep your hand in clinically. Absolutely. And you worked, so therefore, is this right, four days a week for the Department of Health and one day a week as a honorary consultant haematologist at the Central Middlesex Hospital? Yes. Uh, initially, it should have been one day a week, but of course... The, exe <coughs> excuse me, the exigencies of work uh, at the department meant that it was usually half a day. Uh, but I did the sickle cell clinic because there was a big population of, of patients with sickle cell disease in, in central Middlesex. Um, so you, you, I think, took outpatient sessions uh -huh. for patients with sickle cell disease. D did that work involve administering blood or blood products to patients? Not at all. Before we look at the, the specific posts you then held within the Department of Health, um, you told us in your witness statement broadly how the department was organised at the time, and I just wanted to ask you about that in, in fairly general terms. You've described two parallel hierarchies, um, an administrative hierarchy, the career civil servant who would report up the chain um, ultimately to, the, to a permanent secretary in the Department of Health and, and Social Security, yeah. and then a medical and, and scientific hierarchy which reported to the chief medical officer, is that right? That's right. Um, and uh, you joined the latter, the, the, the medical hierarchy. Yes. You've said in your statement that it was the administrative hierarchy that took the lead on policy development, financial matters and supporting ministers. What, what was the role then of the medical and scientific branch in broad terms? We'll, we'll look at your yes. specific jobs in a moment. Well, in broad terms, the medical medically qualified and scientifically qualified staff actually provided the relevant advice, be it medical, scientific, to the administrative uh, colleagues uh, who, who took the lead, as you have described precisely. Uh, and, and essentially, we were there almost to uh, act as a resource for, for the administrative sides and also, very particularly, to act as a kind of interlocutor with the wider world. So that essentially, we were not sitting there simply behind a desk. We were going forth and trying to find out from professionals in the relevant policy areas, if you like, uh, what was what were the thinking going on in the professional um, side of things in the wider w outside world. So we, we attended various meetings of experts uh, in their own field outside, and we brought back to the department information that we had gleaned from that. So we were um, sort of intel. We were gathering intelligence for use by the people who were actually at the business end of doing the policy work or, or briefing ministers. Um, would it be fair to say, and again, we'll obviously look at some detailed examples of decision making in the course of today and tomorrow, but um, would it be fair to say that um, the, the boundaries between the medical branch um, and the administrative branch and their respective roles were not always um, absolutely black and white? Mm -hmm. um, policy on medical matters inevitably brought you and, and your colleagues and, and the chief medical officer and the deputy chief medical officer into advising on... Um, from a medical perspective, but advising on the merits of policy proposals. Yes, absolutely, and I considered that to be an important part of my work. I think the, uh, the problem sometime was, was that although I thought I'd put forward fairly cogent arguments in favour of something or against something else, it wasn't always the line that was adopted ultimately, but that was the way the, the system was structured. 
But I definitely felt that when I could, I should use my medical training to the best effect. Um, in your statement, paragraph 2.25, um, you say that this separation into the parallel divisions of professionals and administrators... Sorry, I'll wait till you've got that. Thank you. Thank you. It's always the page that we can't just get to two point. I think it's page 27. Thank you very much. Yes, I have it. It's just two sentences, so I, I won't put it on screen. I'm just going to read them yes. out. You say, this separation into parallel divisions of professionals and administrators was the same arrangement that Lord Fulton, in his 1968 report on reforming the civil service, had recommended should be abolished. It was the system that had been described as the expert on tap, but not on top. Yes. Could you just elaborate upon that, please? Yes, well, obviously, as I've been preparing this, I've been thinking back to uh, the parallel hierarchy system. And um, about 20 years ago, I think, I wrote a small think piece for the department because there was going to be yet another review of our organisation. Um, and uh, one of the things that I remember quoting in that review was, was something that I read in, in Peter Hennessy's uh, wonderful book on Whitehall, but it was about um, a permanent secretary round about the time of Fulton, I think it was William, Sir William Armstrong, and he, they did not accept the parallel, that the, the, there should be a single unified structure in the Department of Health, or, or between what they call non-industrial civil servants. And, and the thing that he said that stuck in my mind, and I wrote it down at the time, was that uh, it wouldn't do to have the likes of doctors and engineers and scientists on top because the traffic, he said, would be all one way. In other words, if you put the doctors and scientists and engineers on top, you were actually always going to have them at the top of the hierarchy, and it wouldn't do. And, and what do you think were the disadvantages of this parallel hierarchy? Well, I think, I mean, my own personal uh, view was that we should have always been fully integrated. What was the point of having different reporting lines up a particular chain or up another chain? And then at the end of the day, you had to have the two people at the top of the chain resolving things. As an, there's a, an example in here where the deputy secretary on one hand and the deputy chief medical officer had to go head to head to resolve something. Why would you do that? It'd be much better to have an integrated division. And so for your note and for the benefit of core participants and legal representatives, um, relevant extracts from the 1968 report from Lord Fulton addressing this issue are on relativity. I'm not going to put it on screen, but the reference is FLTN 601. Um, and, and then what qualifications or, or knowledge was it necessary to have in general in order to become a medical officer within the medical hierarchy of the department? Well, all I know, because of course I never worked in personnel in the department, but all I know is you didn't need to be an expert in your field or to be qualified in the particular field that you ended up in. The, I joined the department in, and I joined into the medicines division. Now, this was for the assessment of pharmaceutical drugs who were coming up for licensing um, and subsequently for biologicals. Now, I had no relevant qualifications for that at all. I mean, I think that it was understood that I had sufficient intellectual capacity to be able to analyze the material that was sent up by the pharmaceutical companies. But I had no pharmacological particular experience and I had no toxicological experience. So, so they actually uh, appointed me to a job for which I couldn't actually necessarily see that I had any fundamental expertise. Other doctors in, in that um, division might well be um, doctors who had left the pharmaceutical industry and have come in, so they, they knew and understood a lot more than I necessarily did. Then when I moved to MedSEB, which is which the medical, medical division which dealt with blood and blood products and blood policy in general. Again, it happened that I was a haematologist. I didn't have to be a haematologist. In fact, as far as I'm aware, 
my predecessor and my successor were neither were hematologists. So it was a happenstance, if you will. Um, so if, if we turn then to your first period of employment with the department, November 1976 to August 1979, you joined as a senior medical officer in the medicines division. Yes. Um, can you just um, help us uh, with an outline of what the function of the medicines division was? Yes. Well, the medicines division actually acted on behalf of the licensing authority. The licensing authority was the secretaries of state for Wales, uh, sorry, secretaries of state for um, England and for Scotland and for agriculture. So that was the overall licensing authority, but clearly the ministers weren't doing this work themselves. Essentially, medicines division acted for them. And the way in which they acted was on the advice of the Committee on Safety of Medicines. And the Committee on Safety of Medicines itself had been set up under the Statutory Medicines Commission in 1968. Um, and so is it right to understand that the, the Medicines Division, as, as it were, was, did it sit outside these two parallel hierarchies or did it report, to, so, so it didn't report to the Chief Medical Officer? Oh, it did. Oh, it, it did as well. Uh, any, any doctor in the department would be reporting to the chief medical officer. But the medicines division was actually uh, had a separate structure. It was uh, quite different. I can subsequently, if you want, uh, uh, describe that. I mean, not now. I can bring the description uh, of the medicines division. Uh, it had a, different, a slightly different structure. Uh, it, the Committee on Safety of Medicines was the determining entity not the chief medical officer. So if the Committee on Safety of Medicines recommended or took a view on, on a drug, that was going to be accepted by ministers and the chief medical officer would, would never intervene. And then I think you, you, you may in effect have already answered this, but was the work of the medicines division, um, uh, did it cover Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, or just England and Wales? covered Scotland because there was the, um, the uh, no, did it. I'm just trying to remember now. Um, I would need to take, I would need to look at that. I don't actually remember. I, th I can't see why, because the licensing authority, writ probably ran to all of the United Kingdom, but I can't remember about uh, the... I can't actually put it exactly in context, no. And then what was your specific role within the medicines division as a senior medical oh. officer? Well, initially, excuse me a moment. <clears throat> initially, my role was to ass assess new drugs, that is to say, <clears throat> new pharmaceutical entities. And that was a... For, 1976 to 1977, and then at some time in 1977, as I've described, um, I was asked to actually move from the new pharmaceutical entities to biological products. So my job then turned to the assessment of biological products, uh, such as blood, blood products, and also, of course, um, uh, vaccines. And when I say actually shouldn't have even included blood in that because blood was not covered by the licensing uh, system because you can't standardise a, a unit of blood. Um, we'll be, the inquiry will be looking at the licensing process in more detail in later hearings, but um, um, are you able just to give us an, um, a brief overview of, of what, what the process was? An application would be received by the medicines division or by the licensing authority um, for uh, for a license for a new product. In very very general terms, what would the process then entail? For a new uh, biological or a new <coughs> excuse me for a new drug, say huge volumes of data, which were actually provided by the pharmaceutical companies, would would come in all, of course, paper-based, uh, and they would have to be analysed. Now, the role of the, pharm the, the specialist um, pharmacologists and toxicologists in the division, the scientists, they would look at the toxicology, 
loads and loads of studies on mice, for example, and then the, the doctors would look at any clinical data, especially clinical trial data, and it would be our job to pr provide um, an analysis. There was a set format, as you can imagine, forms and format, a set format for us to do that, uh, and that went off to the Committee on Safety of Medicines, and then when it came to that drug being discussed in the Committee on Safety of Medicines, one would be there as the medical assessor to be quizzed and questioned by the committee. And in the period in which you were at the medicines division with responsibility for biologicals, including blood products, yes. um, which I think was from roughly from November 1977 onwards, yes. can you recall whether you were involved in, any, um, in the assessment of any applications for licences for factor concentrates? I don't remember at all, actually. It wouldn't surprise me if I were, but, but I have no recollection of that. Again, I'm, I'm really just calling a, a, a upon your memory in general terms in this regard. If you've got a product, had a product that was already licensed, so it had already gone through a licensing process, um, but there were going to be there were changes, mm -hmm. um, um, either changes in relation to the product itself and how it was manufactured, or increasing knowledge of the risks and, and, and clinical consequences of the product. Was, was there a process then for looking again at the licence? How, 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 did, how did changes get considered within the licensing process? Well, there were essentially, I think, two ways. One is that the pharmaceutical company involved or would, would actually ask the licensing authority to look at a changed formulation or some change that they wished the licensing authority to look at because they wanted a variation to their license. So this could be initiated by the, license, by the pharmaceutical company applying for a license, and it was a, a license variation, if you like, and that was done really quite a lot. If there had been concern generated from no matter where that there was a problem with a particular, um, a particular drug, it would be open to the Committee on Safety of Medicines to say, well, we want to look at this again. Uh, we uh, want to consider the safety issues and so on. Their role was entirely safety, uh, quality and efficacy. And they would be, uh, it would be their role to establish that the product was what it said it was, but also that it was safe, of good quality and efficacious. So they could call in, they could call in a, a pharmaceutical company and ask them to give more evidence. Um, what, if any, role did the medicines division play in relation to um, the, the content of, content of product um, information leaflets? So the, 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 the information that would accompany the, the, mm. the, the, the blood product mm. or, the, or the pharmaceutical product? That was always looked at very carefully. And also, it was a, a matter for the National Institute of Biological Standard and Control for, for biological products. Uh, they were involved in, in the so-called batch release system for, for, for biological products. And they would take great care to see that what was said in the pro uh, product information leaflet, if you like, for patients and for doctors, actually uh, was in conformity with what the license required uh, should be there. Um, now, you've described um, in your statement, <coughs> you recall at some point during this period, uh, visiting uh, um, the manufacturing premises of a pharmaceutical company in the States mm. that was producing factor eight concentrates. Um, you can't, I think, recall which company mm. it was. C can you recall anything about the purpose of the visit? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> The only thing I can remember about it, because I was really trying to think which one could it possibly have been, it was a very long haul flight. It was about 13 plus hours, I, I know. I mean, I actually spent most of the inspection in a, in a fog of, of uh, you know, um, of not being able to concentrate because of the long haul flight. Uh, but it was because uh, the inspectorate wanted to inspect the manufacturing capabilities, the manufacturing capacity. Uh, and um, I went out, I think, with two inspectors, and we, I seem to recall that we looked at two different s establishments or sites, I think fairly close to each other, uh, and made a report. And the report was not a happy one for the, for the manufacturers. 
Can you recall what your concerns were about the manufacturing? Well, it was we were very unhappy, as I recall, about the um, facilities more than anything else. And I mean, the one thing that I remember because I ended up writing it up in in the report, and I do remember this, was that um, the the clean area. Uh, of the big clean area that was not sterile area, but a big clean area. And the the toilets opened up into the, and off the clean area, and people were just toing and froing, and there was no changing of clothes and so on. And that was not good practice. And we wrote it up, as amongst other things. Did, did, how common was it for... for um those within the medicines division to, to do that, to, to go and inspect a, a pharmaceutical premises abroad? I don't actually know. I think that it, it obviously happened from time to time. I mean, a lot of the manufacturing was in the UK and they would be going off to UK um, manufacturing facilities. Uh, I don't know how often others went, but I just recall my own visit to an extent. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the medicines inspection um, uh, of BPL and the consequences for that at a later stage today. Um, but what um, did, did you have a role with the medicines in, inspectorate? Was it part of your work to... Were you involved with the processes of medicines inspections generally? Not generally. I mean, this was a very unusual... For me, it was very unusual and actually... <laughs> quite an enjoyable thing to do. I don't remember doing that to any extent otherwise. I was also trying to remember whether I went on any of the formal BPL inspections. And I don't remember because I was always in and out of BPL quite a lot. So I don't remember whether I went on any of the formal inspections. I might have done. I just don't remember. Um, You said in your statement that it was part of your role during this time when you were in the medicines division with responsibility for blood blood products to liaise with the the BPL. Um, uh, And you mentioned Dr Lane in your statement. Was it initially with Dr Maycock or or had Dr Mm -hmm. Lane taken over, do you think, by the time you took up that role? Dr Lane had taken over. He he had um, joined uh, BPL to be the deputy director as for the year that um, Dr Maycock was about to retire and then it was Dr Lane that I was liaising. I did meet Dr Maycock when I was in medicines division. Um, I have some memories of meeting him when I was in medicines division. I can't remember, obviously it was to do with blood, but I can't remember uh, what in particular. But I uh, know that really all my liaison BPL was with Dr Lane. Now, I'd asked you for an overview in relation to the process of licensing um, pharmaceutical products, blood products. What, what role did the medicines division play in, in relation to manufacturing licences? Oh, c- completely. That was, it was manufacturing licences and product licences. That was their job. Um, and then did the medicines division have any role in relation to clinical trial certificates or clinical trial exemption certificates? Yes, same, same thing. And, and again, in broad terms, what was the nature of that role? Well, uh, it was medicines division. I mean, again, if, you, if somebody applied to uh, the medicines division or the licensing authorities, they were actually were deemed... Uh, for a um, clinical trial certificate or a clinical trial exemption certificate, that was to be considered. It felt to be considered by medicines division. Whether it needed to go entirely to a committee on safety of medicines meeting, I think, might have depended on the product. Um, now, in in September of 1979, mm-hmm. you moved from the medicines division to a division... Um, which I think you refer to as Med SEB, which was Scientific Services, Equipment and Building Division. Yes. Uh, and you were there from September 79 to December 83, then with a period on, on maternity leave, April to October, I think, 1982. Yes. Um, now, this division, Med SEB, was, I think you tell us in your statement, staffed by doctors and by bioscientists. Yes. And so it was part of the medical chain of command up yes. to the chief medical officer. Yes. And, and as I understand your statement, 
its role was to advise and work with um, uh, the health services yes. branch. Yes. Um, so that was part of the administrative hierarchy within the Department yes. of Health. And, and there were two divisions, HS1 and HS2. Yes. Um, and, and they both reported to the permanent secretary. Well, they reported to the senior principal medical officer, and I beg your pardon, they reported to the grade three, who, which was the undersecretary, who reported to the deputy secretary, who reported up to the permanent secretary. And the policy areas that fell within um, the health services division, HS1, mm. HS2, included blood transfusion yes. and blood, po blood yes. products. Yes, yes. The inquiry has seen reference in rather later documents from the Department of Health to something called the Blood Policy Unit. Was anything of that nature in existence at the time you were there? I don't know what that was, actually. Um, now, you, you've identified in your statement a number of the civil servants with whom you worked, and we'll see, I'm not going to go through them by name, we'll no. see the names crop up in documents. Um, but you make a broader point that it was up to the civil servants within HS1 and HS2 the policy division, to decide whether to seek medical or scientific advice and on what. Now, that tends to suggest that the, um, the role of MedSEB was reactive rather than proactive. Was, was that always the case, or was it much more an exchange of, of ideas? I think it's a sort of uh, almost a, a blend of that. It depended how proactive one one needed to be or wanted to be, essentially uh, the doctor in, in the uh, med SEB would have the services of a, a, a PA, and that was it. The, the administrative uh, hierarchy had a, a, a real uh, hierarchy of staff working for them. So it was more difficult to be... Um, you know, enormously involved in, in certain areas because you were only on your own. You didn't have anybody to, to support you to, do, to go out and, and find more information or to research things. So essentially, you did really what you could. And basically, I think... I mean, I had very good relationship with the people in, in HS. I did have no problem at all. Uh, but they were working hard on their areas, and if they needed to call on me, they, they would do so. Uh, and sometimes I was able, particularly if I saw something developing that I um, felt I needed to comment on, I didn't need any permission to do that. I would just do it. So it's, it's a blended thing. It's not black and white, absolutely. Uh, but there was no question that things would happen submissions would be sent up, uh, briefing would be done, meetings would be held with ministers, and I wouldn't necessarily be involved at all, even if it was maybe relevant to, to an area that I was working on. But it, it shouldn't be considered to, be, to have been a massive obstacle to, to working. It just wasn't the most effective way of working. Now, in terms of your own line of reporting, I think you've told us in your statement you reported to a senior principal medical officer, that was Dr. Oliver. That's right. What was his area of, of clinical expertise? Do you know, I do not know. Uh, and, and I simply didn't know about my, my fellow medics. We just got on with things. He, he had an overview of the whole of the division uh, and would therefore, if he ever felt it appropriate, we kept him very much informed. And if he ever felt it appropriate, he would join in any particular debate. But I... I really don't know what his specialty was. Uh, and then he reported in turn to Dr. Harris, That's right. who was Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Do you know what his background was? No. Um, and, and then Dr. Harris would report in turn to the Chief Medical Officer, yes. who was Henry Yellow Lees, and then, I think from October 83, Donald Akeson. That's right. D to what extent did you have direct um, interactions with the Chief Medical Officer? Um, with Henry Yellow Lees, very little. Very little. Uh, I, I don't actually recall having a single direct meeting with him during my time in Med SEB. And of course, he then left Med SEB and uh, Donald Atchison took over. And I had far more interaction, and in fact, in some cases, a lot of interaction with, with Donald Atchison. But 
Initially, not. I mean, after Henry Ellerly's left, it was roughly the time that I moved from Med SEB to Medical Manpower, which had nothing to do with the business of this inquiry. Uh, and there, I would have had some interaction with Donald Acheson, uh, because Medical Manpower involved a lot of face-to-face -face working with the British Medical Association and other medical bodies. So that was something of, of interest to him. Um, to, to what extent were there um, regular meetings within Med SCB? I mean, was there any kind of system of once a week or once a fortnight or once a month um, that, that, that the medical professionals would get together and discuss things, share information about things that had come to light? From, from recollection that we did meet together, we were a very small, a very small uh, division. There were only a handful of doctors and a few scientists and, and one or two sort of administrative support at the, at the secretarial level. So we, and we were in the same corridor, so we would meet and talk. We did have, um, I think from time to time, what you would call a divisional meeting, but it wasn't, I don't remember saying, well, every Monday morning we were having a meeting. We might have done, but honestly, I don't remember. Now, you told us in your statement that the chief medical officer was advised by various um, external doctors known as consultant advisors. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was across a range of different disciplines, but one of the consultant advisors was in blood transfusion. Yes. And when you first joined, the consultant advisor was Dr. Geoffrey Toby, yes. who was chair of the regional transfusion director meetings at that yes. time. Can you just tell us a little about how he, from your perspective, went about that role? Yes. Uh, there were very few consultant advisors uh, in, for, for the chief medical officer. There were just a few disciplines, and I think cardiology may have been one of them. I don't recall, but very few. He had a handful of consultant advisors, and he had a consultant advisor in blood transfusion, and he always had a consultant advisor in blood transfusion. Dr. Tuvey, who chaired the regional transfusion um, centre's directors' meetings, was the uh, consultant advisor when I joined Med SEB. He met the chief medical officer from time to time. I don't know how often those meetings took place, but they were always in private. And I never knew what was going on. He was obviously advising, that's what his role was, but he didn't feed back to me what he was saying and there was no way I seemed to be able to understand what had gone on. There were no notes of those meetings as far as I'm aware. D did you ask, perhaps not the chief medical officer himself if you rarely have ever met him, but did you ask those who, above you in the hierarchy if they could find out um, what, what was being discussed or, or asked, um, raise a concern about the fact that you were being, as it were, kept in the dark? Well, I, I actually used to ask Dr. Tuffy what had gone on, and I don't think that I found the answers terribly satisfactory. I think that's one of the issues. If he spoke to anyone, he's tended to speak to Dr. Oliver, who is my boss, uh, but he was only in post while I was there for about a year, I think it was, and then Dr. Harold Gunson took over, who was entirely different. He, he did meet the CMO in private. It seems that the CMO liked these meetings to be private, but Dr. Gunson always told me what, what had been discussed, and, and I, I, I broadly speaking knew what, I was, what was happening uh, because he was somebody who would just communicate with me. Now, can you just assist with this? Where physically was Med SEB located? Uh, Hannibal House, I think. But, you know, I moved buildings quite often. I think it was Hannibal House. And was the HS division, branch, however it was termed, yes. just wanted, were they in the same building? They may have been in Alexander Fleming House. I mean, we had an estate. That was one of the problems. Um, uh, Ron Oliver was in Russell Square. I mean, it was difficult. You, <laughs> you had to navigate between different buildings uh, as well as actually different um, hierarchies, if you will. I, I honestly can't remember about HS Division, but it should be at the bottom of, of some of these. I'm sure we can check. Um, generally speaking, if, if HS um, wanted advice or input from you, um, what was the means by which they sought it? Would it be a telephone call, or would they ask for a meeting, or would it be 
a formal written request? Almost everything was in writing in those days. And one of the enormous difficulties of working then, and one even appreciated it then, and I'm not saying this with any degree of hindsight, was that everything needed to go on an official file. And you really rarely knew from, from one moment to the next where the official file had ended up and in whose in-tray it was sitting, festering, if I can put it that way, and not being acted upon. And essentially, uh, every document that you wrote should have gone on an official file, which was then sent forward to whoever it was uh, the, intended to be the recipient of the file. So there could be quite large intervals while secretaries searched for the official file. Then, of course, we wrote everything out longhand. Then you sent it for typing. Then it came back from the typist with loads of corrections, so you sent it back for typing. And then, ultimately, if you're satisfied, it went on the official file. This was not a swift way of conducting business. And, and so there would be, if, if people were located in different geographical um, locations, different buildings across the department's estate, um, would there then be files in different locations? Or do you have responsibility for maintaining your own file on a particular topic? The official file would go via messenger to the recipient of an official file. And if it's HS division, the messengers would take it to the relevant part of the department. So if you were sending a minute to Mr Harley, yes. um, it would go through the process you've described, and then a, a messenger would, 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 would literally take that yes. physical document yes. and deliver it to whatever building Mr Harley was Take the file from. and deliver it, yes. And you would retain a copy? Yes. Now, Med SCB was not, as I understand it, the division with responsibility for transfusion transmitted infections. That's right. That was Med IMCD. That's right. Um, so whilst your division had, uh, I say your division as in the division you work for, had responsibility for advice on blood and blood products, yes. the surveillance of infections, the surveillance of communicable diseases was the responsibility of Med IMCD. Yes. Even where the, the infections were being transmitted by blood and blood products. Exactly where they were. Um, and so data from, um, uh, gathered through the Public Health Laboratory um, uh, CDSC. system and, and sent to CDSC mm. would go to med IMCD in the first instance. That's right. And only then would, would they send it on to you then, if it, if it was relevant to blood yes. products? Yes, I mean, I, we relied on them to keep us informed if something was coming up. That was their job to be informed by the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre of the Public Health Laboratory Service. That intelligence would come through MedIMCD, and MedIMCD would, as soon as practicable, uh, let my division know. And we'll, we'll, we'll look tomorrow when we get onto the topic of AIDS at, at, at the broad issue of how information was gathered in relation to that. But the, the MMWRs, which yes. were obviously an important source of information, those, as I understand your statement, went to MedIMCD. Yes. And would it then be passed on to you if relevant yes. to blood and blood products? Yes. And where was, where was Med IMCD located, can you recall? I can't remember. Don't worry, again, I'm, I'm sure we can check that out. Now, that, that's, that split division of responsibility, blood products sitting with Med SEB, infections, communicable diseases sitting with Med IMCD, that presumably meant that decision-making in relation to diseases transmitted by blood products was not the sole responsibility of one division. It was a shared responsibility, effectively. Well, that was right. I mean, the, the, the question of picking up the problem, if you will, actually identifying that there was an issue here with regard to uh, an infection in blood or a trans transmissible um, agent in blood, uh, that was through the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre, which was the... Um, the GCHQ, if you like, of, of uh, uh, surveillance, um, came through to um, MedIMCD, and MedIMCD's role would have been to alert myself and Mr. Harley uh, um, or Mr. Parker, whichever was the, the relevant uh, uh, person in relation to blood products, and um, obviously 
tell us what the position was. But that was the first port of call for that information. Did, did that, in your, in your view, um, looking back, was, was that problematic at all? Did, that, did, did stuff fall between mm -hmm. two stools, as it were? Well, it's, I don't know that I was necessarily aware of that at the time, except that I wasn't necessarily getting everything like the MMWRs as quickly as one might have wanted. Uh, I think, though, um, looking back at the papers that you provided for me, there was an, I had not appreciated that CDSC was actually surveying for AIDS uh, from, I, I suspect, July 1982. That hadn't been apparent to me, and I see that there is a document from Mary Sabellus, who was the senior medical officer in MedIMCD, talking about that surveillance, and this was then coming very close, about April 1983, and all that time I hadn't known that they were doing that surveillance. So that was obviously not optimal. It would have been good to know. Uh, of course, I was very pleased that they were doing it, but I didn't know about it. Um, just in, in terms of how you yourself kept up to date with information, you've told us about, about MMWRs and information from CDSC. Um, you said in your statement you would read the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, you'd read the Lancet and occasionally the New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah. Um, how else broadly would you keep up to date? Well, essentially, of course, one of, the, one of the functions, my functions was to go forth and talk to people who might know about uh, blood and blood products, if you like. Now, my two, no, three main sources, I guess, uh, would have been um, the blood transfusion directors, the haemophilia centre directors, the UK HCDO, the UK Haemophilia Centre Directors' Organisation, as it then was, Directors' Organisation, um, and, of course, ultimately, Dr Lane. Uh, so th those, I would go out and speak to those specialist bodies and also bring that intelligence back in. And you also um, refer to, in your statement, to, to some extent, relying upon <coughs> the lay press and what was yeah. being reported in the press. Well, that really only happened around about the emergence of AIDS. I mean... Basically, I don't know that the lay press was of any particular assistance in earlier issues, for example, hepatitis, but it was only relying on the lay press when it came to, well, what on earth is going on? This disease in America, what's happening, what's happening here? Uh, and that's where they were sometimes apparently ahead of the game, uh, certainly um, producing high-profile material in the press which uh, was actually very helpful because it meant that I could try and investigate and try and find out what was going on. And did, did you have any ability um, uh, to access pre-publication medical research at all, as far as you can recall? Well, the only... I wouldn't normally have, no, not at all. The only pre-publication document that I've found in the papers that you've given me is the a letter that Dr. Krask uh, intended to, to send to the BMJ, I think it was, uh, about um, non-A, non-B hepatitis. But normally speaking, I wouldn't have any, any uh, access to pre-publication work. Uh, you, in part of your, your later career was involved in looking at various matters relating to medical education. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not asking you about the detail of that, but do you recall whether your own medical training um, or indeed any aspect of your civil service training mm -hmm. um, it involved consideration of questions of ethics? At that point, no, not, not at all. I mean, I'm interested in your comment about civil service training. Was there any? No. I mean, I, I didn't... I, I found it very difficult because we were, as it were... You came into the department and you were by and large um, put into an area and expected to become very quickly reasonably expert, at least on paper, in that area. I did ultimately say to the chief medical officer, Donald Atchison, I'm, I'm not getting any training. I haven't been trained to do any of this. And I think I must leave the department and... Uh, and try and get some more um, training outside, particularly in public health. To which he said, 
well, really, the discipline you want is epidemiology. He was, of course, a distinguished epidemiologist. I will release you for a year to go and do uh, an MSc in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which was incredibly useful and formative. Uh, but I didn't have that training when I was in MedSEB. And then just to complete your, your career by way of overview, um, December 1983, you left MedSEB, mm -hmm. um, um, and you, your, your role, I think, was taken on by Dr. Alison Smithers. I believe so. Um, and then you moved to um, a different division, Med M M E. Yes. If I got the acronym right. Yeah. Um, as a senior principal medical officer and undersecretary, mm -hmm. um, but there your areas of responsibility were medical manpower and postgraduate medical education, yes. and you yes. didn't have any dealings with the matters that the inquiries mm, investigated. None whatsoever. Um, um, and then you remained in that post until 1986 when you took this year's sabbatical to study epidemiology yes. at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yes. Um, d d did that um, uh, uh, sabbatical year involve studying matters of relevance to hepatitis or, or AIDS? Or was it more general? No, it, what, it was not an infectious disease epidemiology course. It was actually chronic diseases. So, no, it's not that we wouldn't have touched on infectious diseases. We did. I can remember an absolutely brilliant lecture on the epidemiology of measles, for example, the, the modelling. But it's certainly not particularly hepatitis, not, um, not AIDS, no. You then returned in 1987 to the department as a senior principal medical officer in Med IMCD, so the division that we were talking yes. about, which look, yes. was responsible for in infectious diseases. Yes. Um, and you um, then had responsibility for the AIDS unit, which had been created yes. by that time. Yes. You were in that post for, I think, for a couple of years. Yes. And then in 1989, you became Deputy Chief Medical Officer yes. and Director of Healthcare for the NHS Management Executive. Yes. And you were one of three Deputy Chief Medical Officers, That's is that right? right? Yes. And that was from 89 to 92. Again, very broadly, what, 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 was, what did that job entail? As, as Deputy, Chief, as Deputy Medical Chief Medical Officer. Well, broadly speaking, of course, deputising for the CMO couldn't be everywhere. He had an, an incredibly um, large brief. So you, you deputised for the um, Chief Medical Officer. I think I have put, though I need to find it in the papers, the exact areas of responsibility I had. Uh, it was quite uh, schizoid, if you like, because I was not only part of the policy division, if you like, in, in the Department of Health, but I was also a director of healthcare on the NHS management executive, which was based in Leeds or moved to Leeds. And essentially, uh, I was doing two fairly separate things, policy on the one hand with the chief medical officer and operations on the other hand, NHS operations with the chief executive, Duncan Nicholl. So broad, I mean, the, the areas of responsibility broadly mirrored each other, but were not identical. And then 1993, you took up a role as Director of the Public Health Laboratory Service. Yes. Um, <coughs> and you remained in that role until 2002. Yes. And I, I will come back to that, I think, a, a, li a little at the end yes. of your evidence. Right. Um, I've been asked to uh, ask you this, um, Dr. Wolford. Um, in the course of your, the work that we've been talking about, were you ever asked to sign the Official Secrets Act? Uh, and if so, did that or does that restrict the, the evidence you're able to give mm. to the inquiry? I did sign the Official Secrets Act, and furthermore, when I was DCMO, I had this, the special vetting, if that's the right word, uh, very particular. Every particle of my financial, uh, um, you know, matters and so on were taken apart. I was uh, questioned uh, for this um, particular uh, extra vetting for, to receive secret material or whatever with the classification at the time. I can't remember. I don't actually remember ever having had the uh, pleasure of seeing something that was particularly secret, but uh, I may have done. Um, it doesn't inhibit me at all in this inquiry because I have been, I am quite clear that I must tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so uh, if I inadvertently overstep the mark in terms of the Official Secrets Act, I hope somebody will defend me. Now, I want to turn to, um just the, the, now the relations between the department and, and other bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and look, first of all, at the department and um, uh, NHS bodies. Mm -hmm. um, 
you've said in your witness statement that the department was fairly hands-off in mm. relation to day-to-day -day operation of the National Health Service. And essentially it left day-to-day -day operation, running of hospitals, uh, d decisions on provision of services to the regional health authorities. That's right. Is, is that correct? That is right. And, and why was that? I suppose it depends when, we, when we're talking about, but it was round about the time we're talking about that there was a, um, a Royal Commission on the NHS and that actually recommended that much more devolution to regions was, was the way to go. So that, uh, so far from centralizing power in, in the department, if you will, uh, a devolution should occur to the region. So what, what seems to have happened, although I wasn't involved at all in the financial side of things, is that budgets were agreed for each regional health authority dependent on a whole host of factors and a terribly complicated formula. But basically, every, every region was given its budget and was then told to work within it and the department and whatever its priorities were. And if the department wanted to impose a new priority, the region's response would be, well, give us some more money for that because we've set our priorities. That's what our budget is going on. You've agreed it. If you want us to do X, please, can we have some more money? That was really the, the only lever that I am aware of, really, apart from some moral suasion, which may have been possible from the department to the regions, was that, that money had been given to them and if more work needed to be done of substantial, a substantial difference from the work that they'd already signed up to do, basically, they wanted more money. Uh, the, the, it might, might be inferred from your statement that in, in terms of this somewhat hands-off relationship between the department and regional health authorities, that um, th there was, th the department didn't consider, for example, the issuing of in instructions or directions to, to regional health authorities. Is, is, is that right? Well, it would have been extraordinarily rare, and I can see in the papers that you provided to me, there was one instance where there was a question of, could we force regions to adopt the pro rata uh, system of plasma um, supply to BPL in order to get a pro rata return of material. And the answer was that we couldn't instruct them, but we could discuss, consult, exhort, uh, and, and hope that they would understand the rationale for that, which was that ultimately they would save money. Now, my next question is not designed to try and make you an expert on the legal framework governing the, the National Thank Health you. Service, and um, the, 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 the lawyers can look in due course at the, what, what <coughs> powers were confirmed by the National Health Service Act of 1977. But as far as you can recall, then, was it, was it the understanding within the department that the Secretary of State couldn't issue instructions to regional health authorities, or, or was it more a matter of it wasn't seen as a good idea to issue instructions to, to regional health authorities. Are you able to help with that? I don't know if I if I ever understood it in those terms. I mean, essentially, the Se Secretary of State or the Minister would meet with the chairs of regional health authorities for an accountability review uh, every year or every six months. I forget exactly the, the frequency. And basically, I think that if the, a Minister or, or a Secretary of State said, really want you to do this, I think the chairs of the health authorities would really want to try and do it. So I think there was an element of, no, we're not giving you an absolute instruction, but, but please listen to what it is that we want, would like you to do. Um, now, in relation then to clinical practice and what doctors did or didn't do, you've referred in your statement to the role of, of clinical freedom. Yes. And essentially, you said that, the, that those within the department didn't seek to interfere with the practice of clinicians. That's right. Why was that? We were certainly not equipped to do it. We were not experts. We didn't have the wherewithal to do it. It was the role of the expert bodies, the medical royal colleges, uh, the, the specialist societies, to determine what was or was not good practice. For departmental doctors to have stepped into that breach, as I've said, we were not particularly qualified in any particular area, didn't have to be, uh, would have been quite inappropriate, and it didn't happen. 
but so would it be right to understand then that there was in effect I don't, I don't mean that there was a this was something that was formally written down but there was in effect a policy of non-interference with matters of clinical practice with, with matters of clinical practice that's right even if hypothetically patients were being treated in a way which exposed them to risks that might be avoidable I think if the department decided that that's what was happening they would convene an expert group the, the key thing was to get the um, imprimatur of an expert group a relevant group a group that uh, doctors in the field would could see were obviously um, expert in the area were more than their peers if you will uh, and if you convened the expert group and the expert made, group made a recommendation, then the department could follow up, letters from the CMO could go out. But you needed the imprimatur of the expertise of people who were practicing in the field and not uh, to rely on, on departmental expertise. And, and was that because the perception within the department was that doctors wouldn't listen to departmental doctors then? Well, I suspect there was an element of that, and I'm very well aware from papers that I've seen that the expert groups didn't particularly welcome, even when you attended to try to be helpful, didn't necessarily welcome your appearance at a particular meeting and what you might have to say. So I think they were probably right in thinking that uh, if, if the department or departmental medical staff tried to lay down the law, that would not be well received. And you've used the phrase in your statement of, of clinicians jealously guarding yes. their clinical freedom. Yes. That, that was your perception. Yes. Um, um, what, what about um, the, the chief medical officer, though? Uh, you, a, a consultant might not want to hear what doc, Dr. Wolford or Dr. Waiter or Dr. Smithers or Dr. Oliver had to say, but wouldn't something going out with, with the imprimatur of the chief medical officer mm -hmm. be something that doctors would abide by or at least consider and, and, and um, uh, be assisted by? Well, of course, I'm having to think for yes. here for doctors that I, I wasn't a part of that cohort of people that I'm now thinking for. But, but the answer is, of course, uh, if the CMO um, chose to issue a document, then then a, certainly a count was taken of it and, and hopefully uh, uh, people actually listened and, and acted on it. The thing was that the um, chief medical officers traditionally had issued what you might call very broad public health advice. They did not issue specific clinical advice. They might do that if it was part of a recommendation of the Standing Medical Advisory Committee or of... Um, in terms of the hepatitis advisory group, if there was some recommendation that the whole body of external doctors and the health service needed to know about, then they would do it. But in terms of uh, just issuing statements based on their own view of clinical matters, I, that didn't, didn't happen. We might come back later, um, probably tomorrow, to a couple of examples of, of Dear Doctor letters and, sure. and explore that, that a bit further. Um, but what about the question of, of the, what information patients were receiving from their clinicians? Was that something which the department um, uh, or the, the chief medical officer, as far as you, you can recall, um, ever involved itself in? No, I, mean, I think that's even more... Uh more involving themselves in the clinical domain. In other words, the, the relationship between a doctor and his or her patient was sort of sacrosanct. Uh, it would be um, difficult to uh, suppose that the CMO would come in on that sort of relationship. More general advice might be in relation to vaccines, for example. I'm sure you probably want to ask me about uh, vaccines which the chief medical officer very often, or very often, wrote out about. Um, so uh, that, that's different. That's applying a rule to the generality of patients, but not intervening in terms of what a clinician that says or advises his or her patient. Yes, I mean, I'm certainly not suggesting that the chief medical officer would intervene 
between an individual clinician and individual patient. But um, leaving aside the issue relating to vaccines, and as I say, we'll, we'll look at one of the Dear Doctor letters and, um, on that and a Dear yeah. Doctor letter on, on, in relation to AIDS tomorrow. But um, if, <coughs> if there was a risk mm -hmm. of something very serious indeed, um, uh, would the chief medical officer not regard it as part of his role or any of the medical divisions regarded as part of their role to ensure that patients as a cohort were informed about the risks of mm -hmm. whether a communicable disease or the risks of an adverse reaction? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in communicable disease in general, yes, we the department would sometimes put out um, press releases or put out warnings, for example, if there was a... Let me take an example, for, uh, largely from MedIMCD, where mostly we were dealing with the national outbreaks of disease of one sort or another. So supposing um, the whole of the water supply had got uh, cryptosporidium in and you needed to boil water. I remember that particular one. Everybody was told, boil water. These were very significant major public health concerns. Um, in relation to uh, what I, I suspect you're, you're, you're um, aiming for, if you will, is, uh, let us say, on the question of AIDS um, and what haemophilia center directors and haemophilia treaters might have been saying to their patients. I think you will see in uh, one of the documents uh, that Dr. Gunson assured the CMO that patients were being informed. So uh, the, the relevant group of doctors, the haemophilia center directors, did know about this potential problem. They, obviously, none of us knew the extent, but we knew that, that there was a hazard there. Uh, and so haemophilia center directors were well aware of that, and Dr. Gunson said that they were informing their patients, and he told the CMO that. Well, we'll come back to that issue when we look at AIDS in more detail tomorrow. Um, and I know that you'll be aware, Dr. Wolford, that, that the evidence the inquiry has heard is very much to the contrary in terms of patients being given that information. But, but I, I, I want to explore that in more detail when we look at AIDS in more detail. Um, can I then just ask you, again, just again, on quite a broad level, that what the role of the Chief Medical Officer and of the Deputy Chief Medical Officer... Um, the, the, there was a function in providing, obviously, advice to ministers yes. and to the upper echelons of the administrative hierarchy. That was yes. part of the CMO's yes. role. Yes. Um, th there was a role in providing advice to doctors to some extent. The Dear Doctor letters we'll come back to, but there were some examples of, of, of the chief medical officer providing advice to, to, mm. to doctors um, in, in terms of providing advice to patients and the public is it then really only in those those kind of national examples that you're yes. describing the, yes. the, 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 the water supply is contaminated the, the yes. chief medical officer would become involved L largely unless there had been an expert group had met very specifically to consider, maybe at the behest of the chief medical officer, please will you look at this particular issue? It's worrying us in the department. Please look at it. Their recommendations, those would be promulgated if necessary. Um, so I note the time, um, um, and I'm still on the same broad themes, but moving to a slightly different subtopic, so perhaps a good time for a break. Yes, well, we'll, we'll take a, uh, a break uh, then uh, until um, 10 to, to 12. Yeah. Now, this is the, your first break. Yeah. What I'm going to say applies to this break and any other break that there will be, and there'll be a number uh, during the course of your evidence, as you may anticipate. Um, you're giving evidence. What you may not do is discuss any uh, answer you've given, anything you've been asked about, or anything you anticipate you're going to be asked about with anyone, whether it's family, friend, lawyer, uh, anyone. You can talk about anything else you like. Thank you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you back at 10 to 12. Thank you.